I'm an anesthesiologist, and as an anesthesiologist, I have three tasks. The first is to put you to sleep. The second is to wake you back up. And the third is, during all of that, to make sure that you don't end up dead. In the span of about 15 months, three anesthesiologists that I work with were found dead on the job. The first was taking call at the labor and delivery floor. A pregnant mom needed an emergency C-section, so the nurses started paging the anesthesiologist. There was no response, and eventually they sent security to the on-call room. They started banging on the door, and there was no response. They burst open, only to find my colleague laying face down on the ground. He had suffered a massive stress-related stroke. The second was one of my colleagues who was taking an overnight 27-hour-long call. It's a pretty standard call for us. Took call on a Friday, finished Saturday morning, went home. No one heard from him Saturday, no one heard from him Sunday, no one heard from him on Monday. Finally, when a family member gained access to his apartment, entered the bedroom to find my colleague laying dead in bed with a number of vials of empty propofol at the bedside. Propofol is a powerful anesthetic that's used to put people to sleep. The third was another anesthesiologist. He was taking call at our busy trauma hospital. There was an emergency that came in overnight, needed to come up to the operating room, so the nurses started paging him so he could come set up the operating room so that it would be ready. There was no response. Eventually, they sent out a search party to go look for him. Upon entering the men's locker room, they found my colleague unconscious with an IV in his foot and a half-empty syringe of morphine in his hand. These three tragedies were a real eye-opener for me. Prior to this, I wasn't really aware of the syndrome of burnout. They made me realize that the problems of anxiety, depression, and substance abuse were occupational hazards that affected my field of medicine. What was really interesting also and surprising was that none of my doctor friends were even talking about this. What was more interesting was that I found a lot of curiosity, interest, and support from my friends working in the startup field in, Sil in Silicon Valley. The high-pressure field of startups and venture capital in Silicon Valley had seen its fair share of burnout. In my conversations about burnout with these entrepreneurs, three themes kept popping up. Yoga, meditation, and psychedelics. I came to find that these three modalities were being used by people in Silicon Valley not only as rescue treatments, but also as performance enhancers. Now, this was all very surprising to me, because in all of my years of medical school, residency, fellowship, academic training, not once had I heard any mention of any of these modalities that had been around for thousands of years, and I had not seen them in a single one of my medical textbooks. So I decided that I was going to use my unique background to get answers to some of these questions. On the one hand, I had all of this theoretical knowledge. I knew how to read studies. I could analyze data. I could identify bias in the medical literature as well as the news media. And on the other hand, I had a lot of clinical experience now. I knew how the human body works when it's awake, when it's asleep, and when it's in various states of consciousness. I wanted to draw on these poles of knowledge to evaluate these seemingly skeptical claims that yoga, meditation, and psychedelics could help reduce burnout and boost resilience. I started practicing yoga and meditation several years ago. I started with a two-hour basics class that was part of a two-week-long intro program at a small yoga studio near my apartment in New York City. Two hours turned into two weeks. Two weeks turned into two months. Two months turned into two years. At the end of all of that, I decided I wanted to go deeper into the practice, and I enrolled in a 200-hour yoga teacher training program. I finished that. I decided I wanted to go even deeper, and I enrolled in a 500-hour yoga teacher training program. This was at a former ashram located in the Berkshire Mountains called the Kripalu Institute. I have personal experience both practicing as well as teaching yoga and meditation. For me, yoga and meditation have helped reduce my anxiety, 
have helped me balance my emotions and have made me a happier person. In addition to my own experience, I found that there is a lot of medical evidence to support the claims that yoga and meditation can help reduce burnout and boost resilience. A 2016 study of 20 clinicians working in a stressful surgical ICU showed that yoga and meditation for eight weeks was able to produce a 25% reduction in stress and anxiety scores. It also showed a 40% reduction in salivary alpha amylase levels. Salivary alpha amylase is a surrogate marker in the body for sympathetic activation. A 2016 study used functional MRI scans to show that meditation could improve regulation of emotions, and it worked at this specific network in the brain called the default mode network. Furthermore, it showed that meditation could help lower circulating levels of interleukin-6. Interleukin-6 is a chemical in the body that's a marker for neurogenic inflammation. A 2015 study that was published in JAMA showed in about 50 people that meditation is actually better at improving sleep when you compare that to putting people in a formal education program teaching them good sleep habits. Specifically, meditation is about three times better. We're currently in the midst of an opioid epidemic in this country. As an anesthesiologist and a pain physician, I know that many cases of opioid substance abuse start in the doctor's office. It's when the doctor prescribes a prescription of an opioid narcotic, like Percocet or Vicodin, for a simple case of low back pain. What about alternatives to opioids for the treatment of low back pain? Well, my group looked into it. We did a systematic review and a meta-analysis to evaluate whether yoga was, could be a treatment for low back pain. And what we saw was that yoga can produce about a 40 to almost 60% reduction in pain symptoms in people suffering low back pain. Finally, a 2016 study published in JAMA showed the results of about 350 people with low back pain. What it showed was that approximately 60% of people that were being taught meditation could help treat their low back pain. This was compared to only 40% of people who were getting usual medical care, things like physical therapy and mostly medications. Yoga is a low impact physical activity that's vigorous enough to increase your heart rate, to give you cardiovascular benefits, and it's versatile enough to stretch open tight muscles and fascia so that you can be more mobile and more flexible. It's really what you want out of a physical activity. It's safe, it's effective, and it's accessible. Now, before I tell you what meditation is, let me tell you what meditation is not. Meditation is not about stopping your thoughts from wandering. Meditation is not about completely emptying, emptying your mind. Meditation is simply bringing your attention to the present moment. Meditation is about bringing awareness to your thoughts, to your emotions, and to the physical sensations in your body. For the past few years, I've started to teach our first year incoming anesthesiology residents at NYU how to practice yoga and how to meditate. And a number of them have come back to me and given me the feedback that they feel that these practices have helped them perform better in the operating room at their jobs. For them, most likely, yoga and meditation are helping to reduce burnout and boost resilience. I've been lucky enough to travel recently to cities such as San Francisco, Tulum, Berlin, and Black Rock City. It's expanded my exposure and interaction to people working in amazing fields, such as software, AI, artificial intelligence, electronic music, cryptocurrency. It's really opened my horizons. I would tell my stories and give my lectures on burnout, and increasingly, I was being met with these unsolicited recommendations to look into psychedelic therapy. To friends that were recommending that I look into these psychedelic therapies based on their personal experience, I would always be curious and I would ask them, how would you describe this psychedelic experience? They would use words like mystical, spiritual, oceanic, out-of-body, life-changing. More than a few of them told me 
this was the most life-changing experience I've ever had in my life. Psychedelics put you in a non-ordinary state of consciousness to allow you to have a life-altering experience. Anesthetics put you in a non-ordinary state of consciousness to allow you to have life-saving surgery. I set out to use my background as a medical researcher and as an anesthesiologist to evaluate these seemingly skeptical claims that psychedelics could help reduce burnout and boost resilience. Plant-based psychedelics have been around for thousands of years at a, as a part of holistic healing regimens in several cultures. They grow in many aspects of the world, and they've even been used in Western psychiatry when LSD was used as a part of psychotherapy in the 1950s. Now, all of this was stopped, and all medical researches were halted in the 1970s when these substances were classified as drugs of abuse. We've seen a recent resurgence in their use, and we now have more modern clinical studies that are using very careful experimental design to evaluate their efficacy. Now, my interest was to set out to find if psychedelics could help with anxiety, with depression, and with substance abuse. These are all symptoms that share a lot of commonalities with this syndrome of burnout. In 2016, Roland Griffiths published a double-blind, randomized placebo-controlled trial of 50 depressed patients. He showed that a single dose of psilocybin was able to produce improvements in both anxiety as well as depression in 80% of patients at five weeks. These effects were sustained at six months. Later that year, one of my colleagues from NYU, Stephen Ross, was able to replicate these results. He showed that in depressed patients, about, he had 30 patients in this study, they showed that a single dose of psilocybin was able to produce reductions in anxiety and depression, again, in about 80% of patients at seven weeks. These effects were sustained at six months. 2017, Robin Carhart published an open-label trial of about 20 patients suffering from treatment-resistant depression. Treatment-resistant depression is a syndrome where medications don't work, therapy doesn't work, these patients have tried every treatment out there, and they're at the end of the treatment algorithm. What they showed in this study was that two doses of psilocybin, dosed one week apart, were able to produce significant improvements in depression. And again, these effects were sustained at six months. Now, the reason why I keep bringing up that these effects were sustained at six months is it's an important point because it's very different than traditional psychiatric depression anxiety treatment right now where if you get put on a medication and it's working, you're basically on that medication almost forever. In these experimental trials, People were getting one or two doses of medication, and the effects were lasting for several months without needing any more medication. So modern studies have started to show that there is a role for psychedelics in this symptom, syndrome of burnout, which can be thought of as mental illness. Well, what about psychedelics and their role in mental wellness or boosting resilience? In 2017, Craneman showed that psychedelics can produce improvements in your mood. They can make you happier. Later that year, Carhart showed that psychedelics can increase associations between feelings of connectedness to the people around you, or better mental well-being. In 2017, San Pedro showed that psychedelics can improve your skills of mindfulness. It's possible that they can make you a better meditator. Now, how does this all work? And I think that boils down to two questions. The first, is how do psychedelics work in your body? The second, how do psychedelics work as a therapy? Psychedelics work at the level of your genes. They have effects on your DNA. Psychedelics work on your cells, specifically they work on neurons, th working through the serotonin 5-HT2A receptor. Finally, psychedelics work on various networks in the brain, producing changes in consciousness. They're able to put you in what we call non-ordinary states of consciousness. Psychedelics are neurologically invasive substances, and for this reason, they carry significant risks. Risks such as putting you into a potential psychosis and having persistent hallucinations. These risks are not to be minimized. Psychedelics are still in an early experimental stage 
based on very preliminary studies when you consider our Western medical model. In my opinion, they're not yet ready for widespread clinical application until some of these preliminary studies can be replicated. Now, how do these work as a therapy? Currently, all research treatment protocols are being overseen by trained medical professionals. It's critical to have a proper set, which is the psychological expectations, proper setting, which is the physical environment, and the proper therapeutic relationship between the clinician and the patient. The most important points to drive home are these. These substances are natural. These substances have been around for thousands of years. In many places of the world, they grow in the wild. There's a growing body of literature suggests that in certain clinical cases, they may actually be effective. Despite all of that, these can be extremely powerful substances and need to be treated with the utmost respect and extreme caution. To wrap up, there is evidence that these three ancient and holistic modalities can and may be used to help reduce burnout and boost resilience. When you're on a flight, before takeoff, the flight attendant comes on and gives a safety debriefing. In the event of a drop in cabin pressure, oxygen masks may fall from the overhead compartment. Please put on your own mask before helping those around you. Now, why did they say this? It's because if you pass out yourself, you won't be able to help anyone else around you. As caregivers, we know that the more tools we have to heal ourselves, the better off we'll be to be able to heal everyone else. Thank you.